I'm Johnny Smith. I'm Richard Porter. And this is Smith & Sniff, a podcast in which two friends talk about cars and many other things. Take me to the edge of Devon. Oh, did you do For... all of the Devonian um, <laughs> lyrical reshuffles? Show Me Devon I did. by Maria McKee, obviously, <laughs> yes, was exactly. the highlight for me. <laughs> Days of Thunder spec. Yeah, um, they were yeah a little bit playing through my mind as we as we went to um, the place near Salcombe. Very it's nice, sweet, sweet Salcombe. Yeah, so South yeah. Devon. Uh, yes, yes, it is. I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, lovely. Um, They're all good. Yeah, and latterly uh, a high concentration of badly modified T five Volkswagen Transporters. So well, so yes. I, I was going to ask now. you this because I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah. I'm terrified. <laughs> Lots of that going on, of oh, course. Oh, no. Of course. Oh, gosh. However, we went to a very surfy beach. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. Sorry. You didn't go to Torcross, did you? Uh, no. Okay. I can't remember the name it's of it. It's basically a drag strip along the um, the, the, the seafront, and it's, it's Okay, you know there's that island that's got a hotel on it? You what, Lundy? That? Is it? That's north. Well, Lundy's quite far off. It is very... F- this, one's, this one's like, you know, you practically could swim to it, although I don't know whether you should. <laughs> but anyway, there's a little island with a, with a hotel on it just off the coast, and it, this beach is opposite that. Um, and it clearly has very good waves, because we watched some people doing some impressive surfing. Oh, that's which, great. by the way, impressive surfing is a lovely thing to watch, isn't it? It's a it's a wonderful thing. Full stop. It's using the power of the sea to get y- y- mm. y- your exhilaration. It's great. I was watching these people surfing um, briefly. I could have stayed there all day watching this, but unfortunately, our daughter was having a massive tantrum and pretty much spoiled the whole endeavour. But for a brief moment, I was watching the people surfing, and I was thinking, who did that first? Who went? Hang on, lads. I've got an idea. <coughs> Pass me that ironing board. I'm going out there. What? I love you nuts? That. No, no, nuts. seriously, I've got a plan. Just watch this. Because it's, in a way, you just go, It, in theory, it seems impossible. And yet, all these people who are good at it, in that classic people who are good at things making them look really easy, the sort of effortless elegance of a good bit of surfing. And yet, if you said... You're going to get this, this thing. What, that? It's a bit narrow, isn't it? No, don't worry. I'm going to stand up on it and I'm going to ride that wave back into the shore. A bit narrow. Fuck off. No, you're not. You're going to fall over and break your head open on the seabed. On the seabed? (laughs) How shallow? shallow? On a big rock. A big rock on the seabed, yeah. Um, And yet, it's it's become an amazing thing. But here, uh, but the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because true surfers, particularly young surfers... Yeah. Do not have orange wrapped TT alloys T fives, T sixes. Oh hell no. They just don't. Those no, are no, no. middle aged dad cars. Yeah. So I was particularly fascinated by the young people who I could see coming and going from the surf beach who'd got surfboards on or in their cars. Um clearly, you know, they're, they're, I guess they're locals, aren't they? This is just a thing you do if you grow up yeah on that bit of the devon coast yeah and it's it's all the cooler for it because it's sort of less self-conscious isn't it it's just like if they'd grown up in a city they'd just have a mountain bike or something but it's like you grow up by the sea you start surfing so yeah one sort of not super young person but had a ford galaxy old shape oh nice perfect i saw a a kid who i swear was probably only a a teenager had an old passat estate well, that was. I mean, when I when I lived in the West Country, I mean, the Passat Estate was the king of many. And I things. thought that's quite good because he's clearly he's kind of gone. Mm, the dub scene is a thing. Yeah, I'd like to be dub scene adjacent. Yeah, but I've only got nine hundred quid that I've saved up from working in a pub, and Passander. I want some room. I want I want board internal, not board roof rack. He wants to go just sling it in the back and fuck off. Yeah, and that's what my mate Dan from school um, from pre pre secondary school. He still has a diesel Passat and he still runs it on veg oil and he's a keen cyclist <laughs> and he refuses to have a roof rack because he says it's just too vulnerable. So he has a Passat ah. and just puts permanently has the seats down and has two yeah. two bikes in there with tools and that's that's his jam. Yeah. Rich, that's exactly. his jam. And that's he and I it, thought that was a a pragmatic choice. Yes. In a way. I saw uh, a young woman in 
a second generation BMW Mini that sounded a bit poorly, <laughs> but then I realised those Minis are one of those cars they can make a lot of ill noises and seemingly still go. Well, they had the most vocal electric power steering I can remember. If someone's yes. manoeuvring into a tight spot, it genuinely sounds like you're being chased by a mosquito. I always <laughs> thought. <laughs> and he, I, <laughs> If you're sawing away at the wheel, trying to get into like a tight city space, yeah, you'd be like, you "Where the hell?" People involuntarily start swatting at the air. <laughs> well, I think those those first generation minis. It's actually it's an electro hydraulic, like a hybrid setup, which is oh. partly why it makes weird noises that most of the cars don't. I don't know which bit is making that noise. Probably it's almost like, motor, like isn't it? yeah, when you when you hear a radio controlled aeroplane, petrol yes. engine aeroplane, and they're revving <laughs> so high, you don't really know it's an engine until you've listened for a while. And you go, I've oh, got this an internal combustion engine. I had no idea. Yeah, those. Um, so yeah, a woman in a, in a poorly, possibly a poorly mini, or possibly those are just within tolerance noises that those cars make. But uh, went by and she'd got a board on the roof. Um, a Zafira, old shape Zafira, fantastic. Well, actually, not old shape. It was the one. Um, I suppose it. Yeah, the one. Remember that you could have it with that funny spine down the roof. Yes. It was one of those. It had the spine, the optional spine on the roof, which meant you had the storage compartments in the roof. I think. Yeah, that's that's cool. And did it have the avionic style handbrake, which I still think is really cool? Oh, I would, because though did I th- that one have it? I'm sh- I don't know which gen had that, and I think the one of the Marivas had that. But also, I know mm. didn't Ford have that in one of the Galaxies? Yeah, the Galaxy and the S Max had it. Yeah, see, I I miss that handbrake. That's so much better than an electric handbrake. Can an electric handbrake just fuck off? Can it just fuck off? <laughs> Seriously, nobody likes you. Just go away. You're basically automotive leprosy. Just piss off. Um, my favourite car that I saw, and again, this is, in a way, this is kind of more surfy because it's a VW, but at the same time, it was an old Polo. So a Polo Coupe. Oh, that's so that's so lift. that's so Devonian. That's so West Country. Do you think? Well, when I grew up in the West Country, I. I and I, and I left home. It was only then I realised that, that I think Devon has the highest concentration of Mark II and Mark III polos. Um, ah. Definitely coupes. Because, I, I mean, I, well, I had one. My friend Dan had one. Uh, yeah. In fact, I've owned two. I've owned two. My favourite one was the one well. litre. I had a black one litre <laughs> five speed, which was hard to find because normally, yeah. no, normally the one litre has the four speed, which is doing about 8,000 RPM at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> And I used to, I used to live a long way away from my girlfriend at the time. And I was like, "There's no way I'm doing four speed, no way." So it's, it's good that you thought this through. You didn't just impulse buy a four speed car. But. Oh man, I've impulse bought a load of toss, as you know. I continue <laughs> to do so in my mid forties, but um, <laughs> but back then, um, I took a picture of this old Polo because I just, it, I thought it was rather cool. Um, so I will put that on for the patrons, but uh, but it was yeah, and it had a it had a, a slack surf bag hanging from the roof rack on, over the rear window because like, obviously the person who owned it was out at sea. But, oh, um, oh, did it? Yeah, did it I just look thought it was like, interesting. It looked like a sort of. <laughs> we, I, I don't want to. I don't want to talk for another week's podcast about surplus skin uh, to no. do with gear gate. <laughs> Honestly, the no. Alpha, the Alpha Montreal gear gate is still haunts me. Sadly, um, no communication from the owner of the Montreal to explain themselves. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> since we're all that, very quickly, a, a listener called Rhys Hounslow, uh, has, uh, he's been brazing um, Panda 100 Horsepowers on the, uh, on the Panda 100 Horsepower Facebook group. And he's noticed that somebody's got a picture of their, their re-trim shifter where it's got quite a slack bag with very prominent stitching on it, and the stitching goes seamlessly from the bag to the the gear knob itself. Oh, so to the so perineum. So effectively from- knob stitched <laughs> to bag, and it just it does look a bit odd and a bit puddingy, and often, even a bit chody. So I didn't spot this. This is someone who's really gone to town with also carbon fibre stick on shit on their dashboards. I've realised um, anyway. Um, there was that wonderful song by Seal back in the day called mm. um, Kiss from a Rose. And it came on the radio yes. the other day and I started singing Kiss, Kiss from the Chode. 
and it actually works perfectly, but it does destroy the song. <laughs> it absolutely <laughs> d- destroys, <laughs> totally <laughs> destroys what is quite an emotional song. So, See, I used to that. work with a bloke called Charles Rose, and I used to hear his name inserted into the song. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want what, a kiss, kiss from, from Charles Rose. Charles Rose. Yeah, lovely guy, but I, I you know, just didn't fancy him. Sweet. Um, so the other thing, I won't go on about Devon too much, but the other thing I, I remembered, of course, about, about Devon and the general sort of pointy southwestern bit of Britain is very narrow lanes with very high hedges. Yes. Of everywhere. Yes. It takes three times as long to get anywhere uh, off a main road but what i also realized is you know you do that thing where you sort of come around a corner quite gently just make sure there's nothing coming and then there's a straight and you go fuck it i'm gonna build up some speed here to try and claw back some lost time from all this tucking in and you gun it and then as a corner comes you have to slow right down and then there's a car and you have to really get on the brakes and i suddenly realized all devonians must get about 13 miles per gallon, no matter what their car. You could have a Polo Blue Motion or a Smart 4.2. It's doing 13 MPG because there's so much hard acceleration in first and second. And then I reckon they need new brakes probably every seven or eight months because there's a lot of hard braking from 30 or thereabouts. We, you know what? I, I, that's how I, I grew up with those lanes. And I oh. didn't realise that the rest of the the country didn't have them until I started working <laughs> elsewhere and stuff. And I realised, uh, and, and when I moved to, to where I am now in the East Midlands, where there's no hedges at all, really, and it's mm, all very spacious. open. Yeah, I was like, yeah. this is easy. Visibility is amazing. So I put it down. I put me being a really good driver down to the fact that I grew up around high hedges and unpredictable uh-huh. corners, which meant you have to be hyper alert when you're doing yeah. fast work fast drive work <laughs> and <laughs> road work and also can i just add to that go back to what you just said if you're doing fast work in a mark ii polo let mm. it be known it has one of the worst braking systems of a modern car oh my god worse than classic car no servo on there. no servo no servo and don't let anybody tell you that's because it's more of a racy feel it's just it has no brake feel <laughs> at all it's just laziness it, now Am I remembering this correctly, that when they did that comprehensive top and tail facelift on the Mark II Polo, um, because they'd fucked up and the design for the Mark III, they threw away and started again. So as a, as a, a sort of interim measure, they, um, they, they did a really big facelift on the, on the Mark II. I think left-hand drive cars got a servo. You're probably right. And right-hand drive ones didn't. They just went, oh, it's the British as they can fuck off. And... Um, and we just had to continue with very poor braking. With poems. spasming right legs where you're burying yeah. burying the pedal. <laughs> yeah, burying the pedal. <laughs> There's one for your autobiography title. Well, that's the Late Break um, Show's byline, isn't it? Burying the pedal. Oh, burying the pedal, yes. Yeah. Because it, 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 well, it could mean three things, really. It could mean hard braking, hard acceleration, or just putting the clutch in. Oh, of course. And there are quite a few clutches in my personal cars where you have to be right to the floor, otherwise it's not that happy. In fact, yeah. the, um, that <clears throat> that first ever Porsche, the Porsche number one prototype that I drove, that was a clutch to the ground and then wet count to two, then change gear. I was oh, told was that it? specifically by museum guy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, who was lovely. Sweet, sweet museum mm, guy. Interesting. <laughs> Hi, I'm museum guy. Yeah, um, I'd like to be a museum guy. I was thinking about this. I'd, I'd like, I'd quite like to be involved in a museum. I mean, it's, I probably missed the boat. I don't know, but um, it'd be great. Uh, well, not, no, not necessarily. I mean, why not? You know about the subject. I mean, assuming you mean car museum, not like the British Museum, and you're just going to go around going, "What's that?" At all the antiquities. <laughs> I think it would be yeah, it'd be a, it'd be automotive museum, and I, I mean I suppose I'm keen. And this is a sensible thing to bring up on a podcast like ours, but I am keen to kind of try and feed and nurture the the interest untrusts of younger generations of explaining what has come before and that so much is not new, and just because something's a great idea doesn't mean to say it's always a commercial success and all that stuff. <laughs> I kind of dig, and, and all the all the cars of weird shapes and sizes. You know, I think it's amazing. So it'd be great to um, to be part of great. 
It'd be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? That's great. Uh, great. <laughs> we were, we were in, when we were away. Uh, I was in the hotel room, and the kids had gone to some you know, like kids' activity thing. And I think my wife was in the shower. I just flicked on the telly, and there was some daytime property show, as there always is. And it was a couple of scousers doing this thing. Of course, it was. And and I couldn't stop for the rest of the day, just going chachen, <laughs> which is my favourite word what to say is, with a Liverpudlian accent. Is that chucking? Chachen. Chachen. Ah, like that. Get us some chachen. It's just yeah. It's good. It's a good one to do. I miss I miss living. In Cheshire, because you used to get a lot of the sort of the the scouse, the mank, and then the scally, uh, which mm. is the hybrid almost, isn't it? I, I, I can't quite explain the scally, but it exists. It's sort of Wirral based, it's yes. slightly Welsh, slightly harsh Welsh, slightly Liverpudlian. Yeah. Um, so. Well, it's. I think it's. It sort of reaches. It's Zenith around Warrington, which has a sort of bit mank, bit scouse, bit not sure accent. Yeah. Not no offence to anyone in Warrington, but it's not a very nice accent, really. <laughs> yeah, because no offence taken, Rich. Yeah, no, no offence, offense but you taken. sound awful. No, it's just it's a uh, yeah. I don't know. It's I. I mean, obviously, I. I grew up near there, and it's just I, like I like a good Manx accent. I really enjoy, and a good Scouse accent. And it's funny how those two quite large cities are actually pretty close together, and their accents are very different. But the middle bit of that Venn diagram is sort of around Warrington or somewhere like that, or St Helens. To well, to to keep things constantly geographically swirling around the UK, I've just I've just mm. been come back from Nottingham. I took the this is half term. <laughs> So as I'm recording you took this, your kids to basically in Nottingham. I did. I did went. I did went to basic. I did went to basically Nottingham, mate. And I, what? Because it's, why? Well, I, I don't live that far from Nottingham. I live an hour from Nottingham, and it's got a lot to offer. No offense to Nottingham, by the way. I'm sorry. It's just the no offense hour <clears> now. But I actually like the Nottingham accent. I really like because you don't hear it a lot unless you're in Nottingham. Nottingham is a really cool city. Obviously, it's a big university city, um, mm. and I. I would like to tell you that I went there for all of the industrial grit and the 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 vibrance and the cosmopolitan lifestyle. I went there for laser tag. And uh, <laughs> so, oh, so you just went to the you went to Nottingham for the day. You didn't. You, I thought you meant like you had a few days away in Nottingham. No, but you know what? I'd be up for a few days away in Nottingham. I'm not I'm not afraid to admit that. <laughs> um, I forgot that it used to be the largest cigarette producing city in the country. What? Yeah, you're joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously, seriously. Yeah, and they, wow. They had the they had the most productive cigarette facility in in the UK, I believe. So. Um, <laughs> I, to- I told the kids. But also that. the home of Boots the Chemist, who could provide products to help you give up smoking if you wanted well, to. Well, maybe that's how one of them might have started after the other one to kind of either help or ruin what the others were doing. I don't know. It's it's got mm. a lot of canals, uh, but we didn't go magnet fishing. Although we will go back to do some some uh. some, some gritty city magnet fishing because <clears throat> my son Wesson is still hell bent on find, finding a firearm or a bank safe. <laughs> So I'm, I'm still trying to kind of like, <laughs> damn it. I'm, I'm saying I think it's great to have these aspirations. I don't know whether we're going to find a firearm. You've been watching too much American YouTube where guns are like n- uh, not rare over there. Now, but hang on a sec. Is, again, I don't want to speak ill of Nottingham. I gather I... No, don't, don't Rich. Have I ever been to Nottingham? But I definitely, I like the accent and I like hearing it on telly. I like Vicky McClure. The actor, I think her accent's great, and that's a Nottingham accent. But and Alice Levine, yes, exactly. Alice Levine, also good Nottingham. Alice, accent. Alice Levine, one of the greatest, I think, DJs, and it's a shame that she left Radio One. Uh, but she's a very good um, investigative reporter. And- yeah, I think she, and of course, my dad wrote a porno. She was brilliant on that the podcast. But um, uh, I think that she was unsustainable on Radio One because she's not banal enough. She's far too clever. She's very sharp. Do. You won't believe what had happened to me yesterday. I went to a shop and then I completely forgot what I'd gone in there for. You're joking. No, I'm not, honestly. Which just seems to be the general standard of chat on Radio 1 these days. But no, um, Alice was sharp. Yes, I'm old. Um, yeah, great Nottingham accent. But is, is Nottingham not a bit of a crime hotspot? Like county lines and shit like that? Oh, I don't know. I didn't investigate that. Um, 
But <laughs> what you <laughs> yeah, tell you what, kids, you go into the laser tag. I'm just going to go and investigate some, some gangs feeding drugs. You know, I have to say though, rural areas. Well, I was brushing up on my um, my pistol skills uh, at the laser tag, uh, yeah. which was in a like a uh, which was in a uh, an old industrial warehouse. One of those those old school ones with a sort of like um, serrated teeth roof line you know where they used to have the skylights that open to let all the fumes out whatever they were making but of course because it's laser tag it's all dressed up with like hazard um biohazard signs and um emergency flashing beacons it's great the kids absolutely loved it because daddy running out of things to to occupy the kids in half term i said well we're not going to go away on holiday because we've already been on holiday this year um is there any kind of things you want to do, like for a day trip? And they both just went, yeah, laser tag. And I went, uh, what, is that, 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 that's what you want to do more than anything else? I went, yeah, laser tag. <laughs> so I went, right, okay, <laughs> laser tag it is. And I looked up laser tag Nottingham. And I've got to say, big shout out to laser tag Nottingham because the guy was really enthusiastic and ever so friendly. And also, it's the little things I personally think which make a big difference and you're not allowed to spectate so if you're a parent and you're not going to be taking part in the gut the shooting um there's a free free vend retro arcade machine in the foyer so while my oh. while my kids were doing laser tag i i not only played the final fight classic arcade game which i used to be obsessed with i completed yeah. it so <laughs> completed it mate i completed it mate and that's why I, fi- I filmed it and put it on social media like the ending because i used to be able to back in the west country me and my mates used to be able to complete that on 20 or sometimes 30 pence <clears throat> wow showing my and age. it was harder where you grew up because the machine was behind a very tall hedge yeah that's right yeah visibility was worse um just had to be a little bit more cautious do you yeah, know what cycling yeah. was? Just thinking about the high hedge and the narrow lanes. That's mm. what, that's where we used to cycle. So yeah. w- we grew up having to react very quickly to cycling, I potential did. cycling incidents. I encountered some cyclists, and it's a bit, yeah. And a horse as well. Fucking hell. Come around a corner and there's a fucking horse there. Oh, you love a horse. Yeah. Um, do you like it when horses, when they do a, um, now what, it's a trot, not a gallop. When they trot, but they trot. Is it a trot or is it a canter? Oh, hang on. Oh gosh, which one's slower? One of them's a Mitsubishi. Uh, yes. Isn't it? Uh, it's a lightweight pickup truck. I think it's Trot Canter. There's probably another one. Okay, so it but might uh, be Canter, but it's when the horse is coming mm. towards you and it's doing mm. a not a gallop but maybe a trot canter and it's it's mm. it's crabbing. Yes. When they ever so slight they're correcting themselves. Maybe it's a sidewind. I don't know. But they go, Maybe. they break well, yeah, into it's like a, a crab, like a drift, like a horse drift. <laughs> well, like a like an airliner coming in to land in a crosswind. Oh yeah, that's they exactly. Deliberately bring it in sideways. That's exactly what it is. And I, because I, my my office is the late break show's office is on an equestrian farm. I see people riding horses every day, pretty much, and I see a lot of slightly crossed up, right sideways riding, and it always makes me giggle because it's just sort of correcting it on the lock stops with the with the reins by the neck. It's also like following an old Saxo on the motorway because they sometimes look like they're crabbing a little bit. Yeah. Is it just me or, they, or people can write in and tell us hello at smithandsniff.com. But I think if you follow an old Saxo, sometimes they look like they're crabbing a little bit. Crabbing. Now, speaking of uh, listeners getting in touch, actually, uh, uh, we've had loads of messages about um, uh, after your um, your Dodge Chanquez last week. Oh, uh, oh uh, really? Lots of people writing in about... Uh, <laughs> badges they misread uh on the patreon wayne brooks says as a kid i thought the blue ford oval said jord <laughs> which i can see that that's yeah, jord <laughs> <laughs> also on um, uh, a ford note dave law says not swirly 70s but angular 80s the ford onion oh I, oh <laughs> yeah i absolutely love the other because we used to call them onions did you uh, yeah yeah we used to call them ford onions and there, there were loads of onions in in somerset and devon in fact, yeah. there still are. I think there's probably the highest concentration of surviving onions um, in the UK um, down there. Ben Backhouse says, I always like to interpret a hard-to-read logo incorrectly, and that's why for years I've been buying my shoes from Clanks. Clanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> we've, had, we've had someone else, at least two other people, I think, has noticed that the Clark's logo says Clank. Clanks. That's um, amazing. Chris Rayner says that the um, the Mark III Ford Zodiac badge appears to say Zodiac. <laughs> Zodiac. Zodiac. Um, and John Hammond nominates the, <laughs> the, the Renault Fuiap, also known as the Fuego. Oh, the I haven't looked at that. Gosh, one. the Fuego. I mean, that's a badge you don't see very often, is it? No. Well, no, you don't. I wonder how many of your Fuegos are, are left. Uh, Tom Lane has a couple of good observations. One of them is um, he points out the obvious K and N, which is what the Kia badge has become. Yes. Um, even Kia's realised they might have dropped the ball there. Oh, really? Um, have they? But also, yeah, I think there's been some feedback, possibly in the US, that people now aren't entirely clear what the, you know, what car is that? I don't know, is it KN? Is it one of those things where a um, company spends millions on something which wasn't broken? Shocker. Yes, yeah. I think so. Um, but Tom says, the badge that annoys me most is Skoda's uh, Laurent Clement, which is so swirly it doubles back on itself. He says, my kids couldn't even be bothered to read it. We just made stuff up like Lauren's clarinet or Lauren's killing men. Um, <laughs> Lauren's. <but> Tom- <laughs> Lauren's. Did you just say Lauren's clarinet? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Tom also points out excessively badged factory spec cars. Now, this was a thing, and I'd sort of forgotten about this, but the example he cites is, is actually the perfect example of over-badging, separate badges that... Um, Citroen CX 25 Prestige Turbo 2 ABS. Do you remember that? The, the CX in its yes, later days was, Tur- had a lot of badges. Turbo, on it. Yeah, Turbo 2. I do remember that because there was one that actually that lived around here. Um, Turbo 2. Um, was it? T- yeah, Turbo 2. Did it ever say diesel if it was diesel? Or did it just say turbo? It might have done, yeah. And then, know. yeah, ABS. Yeah. ABS definitely Citroen like to badge their cars. And Vol- Volvo like the Vauxhall. catalyzer. Lambda Sond. Yeah. Now who? Um, what, now c- can we clear this up? Because it's it's probably a, a, an admission I shouldn't make in public. But I actually don't know what that is, and I figured it was just a, a, a cabaret singer because it just sounded perfect. <laughs> Lambda Sond. She does the the cruise ships around the fjords. Lambda Sond. Um, she's a lovely, sweet woman. Um, she always wears. She's just wearing a very plunging neckline, um, even when it's slightly cold, because it's just the way she rocks. Yeah. Um, well, it just, it, I mean, it just means lambda sensor, doesn't it? It's just is that it? Sond is sen- the, sensor. Yeah, I guess Sond is sensor. She's yeah, got but it's a, just, that's what it is. It's just boasting that it's got a sensor that you need on the engine when you have a catalytic converter, I guess, because um, you need to make sure that you're... Um, it was only Volvo that did that. I don't think anybody else did. Uh, that. It was, yeah, because I think that boasting about arcane bits of engine equipment is generally not that cool. Yeah. Because nobody knew what it meant. No. Nobody. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, it, it, that's all it is, just an oxygen sensor that, that helps the. Um, I still like the. I still mixture. like the. I still like the kick up the. Um, up, up the um, sills of a Volvo 850. Where it says sips. Oh yes, on the uh, when you get in the driver and the passenger door. Side impact protection system sips. Yeah, it's great. We mentioned, well, you mentioned you'd seen a, a man dressed like a coach driver in the loose at IKEA. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and and John <laughs> Hammond, a patron of ours, uh, dovetailed that theme with the misread badges one rather nicely because he pointed out that the coach could be a Van Hool or a Van Tool. I, if we're talking of badges which aren't very clear I th- <laughs> that's true i never knew what that company was called growing up it was always like what what, what are van <laughs> definitely something I, is it is it is it not van hool uh, what is it i think it, yes it is isn't it well i hope so because then i don't bloody know if if it isn't van uh, hool it is yeah van hool van hool. and in fact on their website it's written as two words it's van new word hool oh okay but okay it is. Looking at their logo, it definitely just looks like it says Van Tool with two T's for some reason. Oi, or Van Tool. Van Tool. There's no tools van left tool. in this van overnight. <laughs> Jean, Jean-Claude Van Tool. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's more. We've got loads of these. I'll, um, uh, da, 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 I love that the, I'm not the only one. The Chanquez. 
is no, uh, you're not the only one. That's by, uh, so uh, Niall Oswald emailed us and said, in Volvo circles, early 760 turbos are known as gerbos because of the badge. Are they really? Uh, we, yeah, that's, cool, that's brilliantly um, nerdy. It's, uh, he sent us a link to a parts uh, supplier that could do you a badge, and it, does, it just says gerbo. I mean, there's no... It's, it's, it, it, that is just so it's, the capital it's one J. Of those, it's, one of those, it's one of those old T's that's just too... It's yes. too curvy. Yeah, like, um, you know, the, 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 where it looks like it says I clavdivs in um, Roman typeface. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else have we got? Oh, yeah, uh, Thomas Atherley uh, is in Australia where there was a... Um, Holden Barino, which is basically a Vauxhall Opal Corsa. Yes. Um, he uh, he said, I, it reminds me of an experience I had when I was a wee lad. A friend's mum had a new Holden Barina in a rather weird trim grade. For years, and I mean years, I thought the badge on the front quarters read J07. <laughs> it wasn't until almost a decade later when I saw one in a supermarket car park, realised it was a special edition called the Joy. Joy. Uh, and... and <laughs> um, yeah, seven. <laughs> yeah, it, it, Thomas has sent us a picture of this badge. It's, it's a really nineties spec, like sort of uh, bright, quite pastely colours. So uh, the J is blue. There's a yellow circle for the O, and then there's this. It is a bit cockass. There's a kind of green, like a, a very pale green parallelogram, and then a pink triangle to try and make up the Y. And it is a bit confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, who are these people that do these crap badges? It's ridiculous. I don't. Well, it's a whole thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, here's a good bit of trivia from one of my previous books. That you remember the Rover SD1 when it came out had a very minimalist interpretation of the Rover badge on the front. Actually, and, I, um, I don't remember that. It was, look, look, up, look up a picture. Is this the Viking SD1. ship? It was one of the things. The, yeah, but it was like a it was like a sort of skeletal really really sort of pared down version of it and actually it was one of the things that customers didn't particularly like it looked a bit too basic ah. and they, they reintroduced a more lavish badge with multi-colors on it yes the pared down badge was designed by uh, a designer in the rover studio who was uh, formerly a jewelry designer so that's that's the sort of thing that goes on that they don't just get car designers they get people who to do badges i'd love skills. to and actually i went to when they opened, were you? Did you go to that thing where they opened the new Jaguar Design Studio at Gaydon? I didn't. And there was a woman there who was a uh, used to work at, I think, Omega. She was a watch designer. Wow! And they hired her to do things like instruments and other detaily things. So it, is, it does sort of go on. So um, there's uh, another message from James. Carthew or Carthew? Sorry, James. I hope I'm getting that right. He um, points out that um, it rem- he says it reminded me of my family's inside joke. Every sign we see Seat's latest large SUV. If you're going to release a car called the Taraco, notably OK in lowercase, it's incredibly important that you either badge the car in mostly lowercase or p- badge the car in uppercase, but pick a typeface that distinguishes between uppercase A and uppercase R. Yes. Seat did neither of these things. So in my family, the big Seat has become the Seat Taco. Taco? <laughs> Taco. Oh, he's right, it does, because it's T-A-R-R-A-C-O. But actually, the R's and the A's all look the same. So it is it's just Taco. I love all this. I, I, the problem is I've, I, there's so many that I've thought of over the years but i've never written them down so now that i'm sitting here no. with a microphone on i actually can't remember them all so i'm just gonna have um, to like this is a slight it's a slight variation on a theme because this is not so much just the typeface of the badge but also orientation of the badge from riley ryan he says uh in late 2020 i bought a new to me 2012 e92 m3 composition the V8 one and all that. Oh, nice. I collected the car from the dealer, drove it home at rapid pace, driving it all all the way to the 8,400 rev limit, basking in the glory of the motor. I've done it. I've bought the ultimate driving machine, I thought to myself. I pulled up at the house. My now wife hopped in and had a look around. Very nice, she says. But why does it say ew on the ledge here? As she gestured to the door sill. Oh! Ew, I said. Ew. Absolutely confounded. <laughs> well, he's... <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you on about, I said. So I hopped out and opened the passenger door and inspected the sill to see what she'd been talking about. Now, he sent us a picture of 
the M3 sill plate kick strip. Yeah. But when you look at it when you're sitting in the car, it's upside down. It's true. And it does it indeed says, appear to say ew. ew. So it well do you know what never has that applied better to the current crop of um spout cars because well Mm. Because really, they are quite ew on the outside. Yes. <laughs> when you're on the inside, they're kind of a, they're M3. But on the outside, you have to then look back at them and go, this doesn't look as good as any of the previous ones. Can we just can we just have the old one back, please? Yeah. And do you know what? To that um, end, I'm getting fed up now of people who are buying the new M3s, M4s and going, do you know what? I've lived with it for a while and I'm actually getting really used to the looks. No, you don't have to. What you're saying is it's still not a very good looking car. It still drives really well, but it doesn't look as good as any of the previous ones. OK, and you know that you're just justifying it in your head. Yes. And if you've bought a BMW um, IM or whatever that gigantic one is, I saw one of those. Oh, the XM. XM. Yes. Well, apparently it's tanking <clears throat> sales wise. So um, that'll learn them. But um, well, can we just. I mean, yeah. Can we. I mean, there's a whole underworld of banger racers who really like destroying quite valuable cars can we just give them to those guys and can they have an can they have an xm one make des- destruction series please yeah the improve the styling series where you're encouraged to smash one into another well the new the, the new m2 it could go round the short oval and constantly crunch its arches against the armco and it would look the same <laughs> buff off its swollen bollock styling um <laughs> I've got another badge on here that tickled me. I will wear this up in a minute. But Carl Telford uh, emailed us, said, I grew up in the 70s fascinated by cars and became irritable if I couldn't identify a particular model. <laughs> and that's so it's so honest. Well, I know, but I know exactly what he means. I'd be the same. I, I was the same. I am the same. Um, he says, one day I spotted a snotty 1950s car and was aghast at the confusing badge. Now, he's attached this. It's, it was what he saw turned out to be a Peugeot 203. But do you remember the Peugeot badge or script in those days was very sort of... Swirly. Say almost Art Deco-y. It was. It was calligraphy. It was something Ca- calligra- that produced. Yeah, calligraphic. Very, very curly. But the, the opening P does not look like a P. If anything, it looks a bit like a, a Q or some other letter, maybe a G. As Carl says, I couldn't decide if it was a que que or a Gugot. <laughs> que que. Quack 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 quack. It does look like a Q. It looks like it says quick quack quack. Uh, thankfully, my mum was there to put me on the right track. He says it was a Peugeot. Wow. Um, he says, but I was not alone in mispronouncing the brand. In Nigeria, people said Piju. Cockroach four hundred four estates were popular when uh, his mum lived there in the sixties, and used, she used to have to dodge them whilst driving around Lagos in her mini barefoot. <laughs> I take her word for it. Um, I think we want to know more about your mum, Carl. She sounds brilliant. She does but, sound uh, fantastic. But yeah, anyway, that's, uh, yeah, from now on, Peugeot's are quack quacks. Um And finally, um, Kov Badori. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Sorry, Kov. Uh, he said, I once had a girlfriend laugh at, the, at my silly nameplate on the lower C pillar of my Saxo. I pointed out that it reads 16 valve and was completely standard. But she genuinely didn't believe it. And it's true. He sent a picture of the 16-valve badge from a, from a Saxo. Yeah. I presume it was a VTS. Um, it, you can, it looks, you could read it as saying Cov, particularly if the driver was called Cov, you'd assume he'd personalised his car. That's amazing. That's definitely, that's the letter of the week. That is the letter but of the week. it's also driving around blissfully unaware of this until someone goes, it's, in fact, it reminds me of uh, uh, Quentin... Wilson used to have a private plate. You know, he was a big fan of just... I was always saying on old Top Gear, put a private plate on it, no one will ever know that it's not a new car kind of thing. Yes. He bought an old S-Class or something. And he bought a private plate. And he, you know, also used to love a one plate. Get a one plate. It's better than money in the bank. Yes. And um, so he had a one plate uh, that was one Y-A-K. And it was just, you know, it's just a sort of yak, generic-ish but valuable plate that he could slap on his latest Lexus or S-Class so that no one knew how old it was. One yak. Practising what he preached. 
and we were on a shoot once. Someone went, uh, so you've got that play. It's, it's I yak because you talk for a living. Oh. And you've never seen Quentin look so horrified at the thought that this was... That he'd actually got a private plate to try and describe what he did for a living. That he talks for a living. Uh, I, I, I think he'd sold that plate quite soon afterwards. Because he was mortified that people could read stuff into it. That's brilliant. Um, thank you to everybody who wrote in with badge-based confusion. There's, there's a few more, but I'm afraid I've lost them. Um, but that's fantastic. Do keep them coming. Uh, or anything else you want to tell us, we do read all your emails, even if we often forget to reply or read them out. Uh, hello at Smith & Smith. Can we call this the Chanquez Files? Is this the yes. <laughs> time for a trip to the Chanquez desk? My mate, yeah, from Kov, yeah, Harpao, yeah. I'm not being funny, yeah. Big news, yeah, over in, like, Japan, like, a long way from Coventry, yeah, but doesn't matter. Big news, everyone talking about Tokyo Motor Show, but it's not even called Tokyo Motor Show anymore. It's called Tokyo Mobility Show, yeah, which means, like, yes. mobile, not phones, like... Travelling like wheels, yeah? Honda, yeah? Got a new prelude. <laughs> Revived, yeah, as a sleek hybrid coupe, yeah? Honda saying, brand committed, yeah, to joy of driving into an electric... Don't know about the electric thing, yeah, but listen, it looks rude, it looks <laughs> slick, it looks wet. I love it. <laughs> you must see the pictures of this. Have you seen the imagery of this shit? <laughs> Unbelievable, yeah. Listen, I, I'm going to read this. Prelude concept, specialist sports car that will offer exhilarating experience that makes you want to keep going forever, says a guy called... Hang on a minute, what's his name? Oh, he's the president and CEO of Honda called Toshihiro Mibi. <laughs> like, new prelude intended to embody Honda's unalterable sports mindset. Listen to that deep shit. They're committed, they're bringing it back here. <laughs> This runs deep. Like, I've stayed up all night, yeah, just to see all of the Tokyo Motor Show, like, press releases. Never knew in my wildest dreams yet Brenner was coming back. No more 2.2, no, bad shit. But plug-in hybrid could be rude, yeah, could be, could be, could be good. So hybrid, American market and all that, but I'm excited. You? What about you, yeah? Yeah, someone pointed out to me the other day that the the new Prelude uh, does look quite a lot like the old Renault Laguna Coupe. It does. And now I can't not see that. And that's no bad thing, because that Laguna Coupe was quite a nice-looking car, but I think that the Prelude is not as nice-looking because it's got a funny duck face. It has. It, it, what I would say is, <clears throat> at the top of this conversation about the Tokyo um, Mobility Show, mm. the Coupes are back. Or so Japan says. Well, yeah. There's a lot of two door swoopiness and a lot of th- this prelude included, this prelude concept, not a lot of like mad winglets and um, bo- boxy arches. It's almost the opposite design language to like what BMW are doing lately. Yeah, I, I think this is a reaction, isn't it, to a lot of the sort of fiddly, needless crease work of recent years. <laughs> Everyone's going back towards smooth simplicity in the Tell me about it, yeah. cyclical way that this smooth. design works. Because nothing uh, epitomises that more than the Mazda Iconic SP. Oh, yeah. Which is, um, uh, I mean, basically the new RX-7, isn't it, when you look at it? Yeah, what's weird about the... the, the I'll just bring it up cause it, to, to refresh my mind. But what's weird is every... Mazda have called it the sort of new design language or the new direction of the MX-5. But mm. yet it's got a rotary... Is it a rotary hybrid powertrain? I think it is. Yeah, so so it's, um, it's a range extender because the Mazda is doing this for reals now anyway. The, uh, Audi were going to do it a while ago, use a little Wankel engine as the range extender onboard generator. Yeah. Because I guess very smooth, very quiet. I mean, there's obviously thirst issues and stuff, but I guess they're good at just sitting there, kind of constant revs very smoothly, mm. getting on with what they need to do. Um, but Mazda now, because obviously they're big into the Vankles, have... Uh, you can buy um, a Wankel rotary range extender Mazda, as it is, and this one is 370 horsepower, I think they say. That's right. Um, and it, it looks, it probably is the car, the iconic SP, worth looking at if you're, uh, if you're, if you're not sure of it. Um, well, 
I because this this was announced. The Tokyo show opened when we were away, and I was just looking at stuff on my phone, and I saw various car journalists wanking themselves senseless over this car. And I looked at the <laughs> original official images, and I thought it looked a bit shit. It looked like sort of unfinished, like a kind of of you know quarter scale model from early in a car design that you sometimes see. It it just didn't look finished. Mm. It turns out those were just like CGI renders. And I was talking to a car designer I know, and he went, those are shit. They're absolutely shit, and they're really bad. for. They shouldn't release them as publicity photos because they give no sense. Your eye can't wander over the f- a flat image like Ooh. that. It's too, too flattened. And then I looked at pictures of the actual car at the show, and there's a video of it being revealed, and actually it's fucking great. Mm. It's got pop-up headlights, Rich. Mm, I mean, seriously, I so they know the younger generation are talking of strumming yourself senseless, strum, strum themselves senseless over pop-up headlights. They, the, the whole rotary thing, even though I, it was 2002, I think, that the RX-7 got, got, got put to bed. Yeah. Um, so it's, got, it's, it's, it's ticking a lot of boxes here. Swoopy coupe, mm. rotary. <laughs> Swoopy coupe. Swoopy coupe, rotary, pop-up headlights, mm. Um, I think mm. it's rear wheel drive, um, and uh, yeah, I assume so. Yeah, and it's and I, I think it's going to be like less than one point five kilos, so about the same as an Amira four cylinder with with yeah. more power. And um, yeah, and I mean, it looks. I can't really see much that's not production feasible. Maybe the doors. It's got kind of um, what are they? What are those what doors? What do you call it? Swan wing doors. Oh, what are they? Button on butterflies? Are they? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Moth moth wing doors. <laughs> moth ra. <laughs> I don't know. But yes, in many ways, this to me just looks doors. like this is this is a, a new RX seven. It's a coupe. It's got a Vankel engine and. Um, well, I don't. It's a Mazda. I don't know why they don't call it the RX-7. I think I get more of a fanfare because it's been away for twenty odd years. But try this on for size. I think, and I, I've thought this for a long time. The Mazda RX-7 was the most consistently good-looking Japanese car ever. Oh, agree. It's aged so well. Yeah, all three generations yep. are just great. The first and the third, particularly the third, I think is just a fabulous-looking car to this day. Such a nice. I can't car. believe. First I, I can't believe how well it's aged. Can't believe it. Mm. It's amazing. To, isn't to it? say it we came out. Did that car come out in the early nineties? I think it came out in the early nineties. That shape. Yeah, I think so. So it ran for um, ten years till the early two thousands. Yeah, mad, mad. I said, you ever drive one? No, no, I've never driven one. I've been a passenger in one. Um, and I, uh, I got a close friend, a mutual friend, Mark Riccioni, who had like a five or six hundred horsepower mental one. Uh, but it was, it's mm. unsurprisingly, it did spend quite a lot of its life off the road. Uh, um, <laughs> and I, I like a Wankel. I, I've never had one. Mm. But I kind of no. There's a fast. And when the RX8 was launched, I got given a, like a desktop. Uh, d- not a diorama, but one of those mechanical um, representations of how the internals of the engine work, the Renesis. Oh, okay. so it had it showed how the the rotor worked, and I gave it to my 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 nephew Oscar years ago now, mm. and he still obsesses over it, and he is a massive rotary fan to the point where he he is going he will own he will own an RX seven. He absolutely loves those third gen RX sevens. And the second one's actually was the second one the one which you could get as a convertible, which was much rare, rarer. Yes. Yeah, he yeah. really digs those too. I because I've never driven one of the third gen, but I have ridden in one, and I think it was Mazda. I was when I started at Old Top Gear, so sort of ninety eight, I suppose that they. I think they stopped selling it, or they're about to stop selling it in the UK, and Mazda still had one. And one of the guys I worked with absolutely loved it, and he borrowed it from Mazda, their press car, before it was sold off, just for shits and giggles because he loved it so oh, much. I bet. And I went out with him in it, and I just remember that, you know, the engine, that that sort of uncanny smoothness of the engine, but also the ride was absolutely shockingly shit bad, and that sort of struck me a bit as well. But I'd still love to have a go. At I it. think it just, I'm just so I'm pleased that the the rotary the wankel is coming back in some form because i to be honest i didn't think it ever would 
But I mean, we'll have to. We've no. got to blast through the. Um, there's there was there's a lot of goodness, and I've got proper Tokyo Auto Show FOMO because I've been there. I've been lucky enough to go there probably five times. Have you? Yeah, I've been there quite a lot, and um, it's always amazing. It's always amazing. But you know, mm. as I've said before, the, the 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 car company that always left the longest impression on me was Daihatsu. And oh. this time, they've gone and done it again, albeit digitally, because I'm not there. But Daihatsu have launched a couple of really cool little things. One of them is called the Mimo. The Mimo looks like... Mimo. The Mimo looks like... Um, I mean, I'm not going to do it probably the greatest of service. It looks like a Citroen Ami that's been crocheted. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's selling it to me. Come on, keep going. Um, it's designed to a. It's an electric city car offering interior and exterior customization. Ah, oh, that's why it looks like it's been crocheted to suit changes uh, in the customer's stage of life. For example, uh-huh. it was shown at Tokyo with a child-friendly interior setup featuring a sandbox, a toy bin, and quirky multicolored bodywork. Well, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, but more relevant is the Daihatsu Ospano and the Daihatsu um, Vision Copen. Ah, the, now this I have seen. Yeah, yes. the Vision Co- So if you remember the Daihatsu Copen, which I really liked as a little micro roadster thing. Um, mm. And I remember in the earlier days of my um, motoring journalist career, I was one of the few people that really liked it. Um, but yeah, so the Vision Copen looks like the old Copen just brought up into the the latest 2023 kind of style. It really looks distinctive, though. And... Um, but it's not a K car. I think it's going to have a 1.3 petrol, not a 660 cc. Yeah, because it's actually grown. It's it, it can't be a K car because it's too big as well. I think it's MX5 size now, isn't it? And yes. Or uh, well, the concept is yeah. assuming they'll go through with it. And, and it's rear wheel drive now, like not front. Mm. So it's going to be more of a more of a driver's car, I think. But the Ospano looks like uh, again. It's a it's a two door roadster but it looks a bit high off the ground and it's got kind of like uh matte finish black bumpers front and rear kind of looks like a smart like an old smart 4.4 but two door i don't know this but again i just quite like it daihatsu Mm. i want i miss daihatsu can they come back to the uk they disappeared and we need to come back and toyota own them now so toyota should just relaunch them you know, everyone else is abandoning Don't small they? cars, and Daihatsu are pretty much a small car making company. So, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, maybe, but it's, it's exchange rate, isn't it? It's exchange rate. That's the why prices it's are low. Yeah, like they are, they are susceptible to your fluctuations, and that is what caused them to depart from the UK market in the first place. I believe we've all been there, mate, with the fluctuations and all that. I'll tell you what. Besides the uh, prelude, yeah. Um, Honda also, they've launched two ve- very, very small but appealing ve- vehicles. One of them's got a very high forehead, but I do like it. And it's called it's called the Honda CI-MEV. Right. It's a pint-sized two-seater for those unable to walk long distances and who live in urban areas where public transport is scarce. So it's kind of like a really cool Japanese take on the Sun's Permis French on monstrosities. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the drunk old person car, as they're, as they're known. <laughs> well, it is, though, isn't it? got a face like a deflated basketball. Do you like drinking lots of wine? <laughs> Et voila. Have, have, you, have you been banned from driving for having yes. three <laughs> bottles of red over lunch every week? Okay, drive one of these, because obviously nothing bad could possibly happen if you drove one of these. Well, no, I, uh, the, the, maybe this is aimed at... Because, again, I've, I've not really seen this personally, but I've been told about it by a few people who have lived or spent time in Japan, that there's that sort of... Well, there certainly was that kind of drinky culture amongst business people that you know you sort of work really hard all week but then one night you'll go out and you'll just get absolutely clattered yeah and you will as a mate of mine saw once you will then crawl across a hotel lobby on your hands and knees whilst wearing a full business suit 
attempt to enter a lift and then the lift doors will close on your head <laughs> causing, the, causing the hotel concierge to run at speed across the lobby shouting in japanese oh no i've witnessed this on the uh, the tokyo metro oh um, really yeah on friday evenings late where yeah. they've had a really long week you know many many working hours and then they've just mm. had a quick blowout like a dinner after work and just gone to hell with it and gone hard on the sake and yeah and they're just they're tripping over everything with the with the with a leather briefcase and a smart suit and they're they're properly ruined you know they've got scuffs on their face and like <laughs> and tears on the one of their trouser knees you know like because they, they've properly like overcooked it yeah. a mate of mine who lives in japan told me he once saw a guy sitting outside a bar sort of just on a low wall and he was kind of with his head almost between his legs but so, someone maybe himself he'd hooked a plastic carrier bag a handle over each ear so he sort of had like a horse's nose bag but it was for, for catching his own vomit so he kind of had a nose bag of sick around his head <laughs> that's embarrassing that's embarrassing. Mm, There's a bit embarrassing. Oh my but, god! Anyway, I, I um, so so the yeah the CI dash MEV. All I would say is, besides it looking pretty cool, uh, better looking than the AMI, in fact, um, mm. it's a demonstration of Honda's sustainability goals. So it's finished in acrylic resin rather than paint, which presumably makes it more easily recyclable. Mm. Um, and then there's something called the Sustainer dash. C or sustain yeah it is sustainer sustainer dash C which sounds like a specialist cleaning product but it's got a face like a Honda E um and it's an electric super mini like a Honda E and it's there again to um showcase lots of sustainable bits and bobs but what I like about that I hope because as we talked about quite recently ye old Honda E is being discontinued and I think it would be a real crime if if no other Honda product shared its design language because the design language wasn't its problem. And I don't think the design language is why it didn't sell well because it looked Mm. far more funky than a Fiat 500, let's say. So if Honda Honda abandon all of that, and I think they're making a big error and I'd like to give them a dry slap. (laughs) I know... um I was saying sort of car design may be shifting towards kind of smooth and unfussy after years of excessively creasy nonsense but yes. um i noticed that there are a few nissans at the um tokyo show that haven't got that oh my gosh I, yet. I was i was wondering if you were going to bring this uh They're very, there's some very creasy shit going on and i'm not sure some of it's all right some of it not so much what about the names read the nissan names is it the the hyperforce is the one that's sort of like a gtr basically sort of reinvented and made ridiculous but it's quite cool looking but it's kind of you just go all right it's very concepty and i don't know whether they're going to um yes i presume this is sort of giving us softening us up for the next gtr which i guess will be an ev um yeah that's uh, that's what they're saying the one that caught my eye were they all hyper they're hyper something yeah they all are hyper um, so the hype yeah as you said the hyper force is the sort of um foreplay to what will be the gtr as a fully electric uh, madness using solid state batteries um uh-huh. then you've got the hyper this looks like that truck from tango and cash if you remember that <laughs> 1989 film <laughs> smash hit with sly, sly stallone and uh uh what's he called snake pliskin what is he yeah thingy um uh, goldie horn's husband you know, oh bollocks. bobby bobby stickleback yeah um <laughs> <laughs> no, the Nissan that caught my eye the was, the, was the Hyper Adventure. It's the Hyper Tora, though, that I thought, because that's basically the next L Grand, surely, and it's actually the one that isn't all creasy. It's got very flat, smooth sides. Oh, um, but I presume it is the new that one. this will just be the uh, what E fifty three L Grand. Yeah. And then, as we learned last week, there'll be a Facebook group called E53 Only, <laughs> and you won't be allowed to join it if you have I, any other sort of L Grand. I have to say, I'm glad you brought up the Nissan Hypertura, because it's the most ravey and, I suspect, um, anger-inducing for Stellantis car, because Stellantis should have made this. It's so ravey, it's got, it's got, it's got like a visor, like a Daft Punk-style uh, uh, headlamp <laughs> visor going on with strobing crazy lights and things but it is it's just um 
it's just a, a very um, aerodynamic body kitted quite a big chin guard isn't it oh yeah very big chin mm. guard uh people carrier with 360 degree swivel front seats and a floor made out of leds nothing sounds more stellantis <laughs> than this <That's> so rainy. <laughs> <laughs> but yet they don't um, make it it's nissan well uh we should we should start to bring this into land I, is there anything else at the tokyo show that really caught your i really eye before we um end? subaru seem to actually be doing something interesting which i quite like um so quick mention for just look it up when you're not listening to us talking bobbins <laughs> subaru spout mobility concept it's got very close eyes which look like austin allegro headlamps <laughs> <laughs> honestly but it's 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 slightly jacked up um sports coupe apparently in celebration of subaru's rallying pedigree which i like and um it will have torque vectoring four-wheel drive. Of course it will. And mm. then Suzuki have come out with another. I mean, we all love a narrow Suzuki JDM vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> Suzuki, do. Suzuki do an E, lowercase E, capital W, capital X. So the Suzuki Ewix or OX. And it's... I've got to tell you, it's so cool. The the, the surrounding um, of all the side glass is highlighted in bright yellow, and the front light grille is the same, like a lozenge shape. I don't know, there's something very kind of 70s robot about it, and apparently it's a crossover of fun and practicality, but it's really just a boxy <laughs> K car. That, that it's is the, the next... Car. I think it's the and next wagon art. It's the next wagon oh, okay. It's going to be fully electric, yeah. and it's going to do 145 miles or something. And I just want one... Because we, we're continuing this daft fetish of ours. In fact, you know, I said I wanted to work at a museum. Mm. Can we start a K-car museum, you and I? <laughs> well, there's that small car museum in America, isn't there? Yeah. So we could do a sister. But the, yes, we should Johnny's definitely. world of K-cars is definitely an idea that needs to happen in some way or other. And, um, Johnny, uh, yeah. Johnny no, I'd like I'd like them to bring something like this over because at some point, you know, we'll, our, our VW E app is is a leased car. It will have to go back, and I would like to be able to buy a very small electric car for scooting about town. And there aren't that many around because the E app is dead. Um, it is, isn't it? What else is there? Everything else is just a bit bigger, I think, at the moment. Um, maybe that new Citroen C three E C three. Yeah. Which, um, I don't know. I don't like the look of that very much. Well, if I was you, pal, I would buy a one-year-old Honda E right now. That's well, what I would do. maybe so. Maybe so. And all that. Anyway, that's for the future. Uh, for the present, we should probably end this before we do. Um, I have three things to tell you. They are one. Johnny has a solo YouTube channel. It's called The Denigrate Cape Show in which Johnny aggressively slags off anyone who wears a curtain of fabric around their neck. Uh, this week, he turns his rage on Superman, who he describes as a greasy-haired ball bag. If that's not to your taste, then there's always the late break show. Lots of excellent videos on there. Um, what have we got? I might have even shout, shouted KP Prick at him at one point when I was yeah. a little bit drunk. <laughs> it's just going to get caught in a door, you bellhead. <laughs> And you've got Y fronts over the top of the other garments. What's that all about? You're never going to get laid walking around like that, you goon. Um, okay. Um, so, so this week on off of an all out the late break show. Well, um, I do. Ten years after it was launched, I decide to drive the Volkswagen XL1, the hypermiling oh. hybrid hypercar. Really. Um, so I decided to drive Volkswagen's own one that they lent me. I didn't drive it when it was new, and I've always been fascinated by it. Mm. And I do, I do a little bit of a comparison with my Honda Insight, because they're kind of kindred spirits in many ways, I suppose. Mm. So I do that, and then if you haven't seen it, there is an update, a well, I'm, and I'm going to put my hand on my heart and say it's well overdue update on my Austin Allegro Type R street sleeper oh. project. Um, yeah. And to just assure people I haven't given up and it is getting there and it's it's I'm really pleased with it I'm really excited about it again so I'm thrilled hopefully the viewers are thrilled too mm, um, I'm sure I'm sure they will 2024 is the year Richard for many things um, and all that. speaking of which uh, I second thing I've got to say is I've got various books out and I hope that at some point very soon one of them will be boring car trivia for uh, it's just taking longer than it should because of other things like 
work and stuff. Well, because your children are asking for complicated breakfasts in the morning. Well, complicated they? breakfasts, complicated packed lunches, all sorts of things. They're rapacious. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, that will be coming along at, uh, at some point. But in the meantime, why not buy uh, volumes one to three? And the third thing I've got to tell you is uh, we all know that a baby kangaroo is called a joey. Yes. Do you know what a male adult kangaroo is called? Um, it's probably a badge on the back of a car that we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> is it? Is it the Ford badge? Is it a Jord? <laughs> no, <laughs> not, it's not a Gerbo either, sadly. Uh, no, it's a Boomer. A Boomer? Yeah, a male kangaroo is called a Boomer. A female adult kangaroo is called a Flyer. Gosh, why didn't I know that? I know, it's odd, isn't it? You, I mean, every time you do these things, I'm impressed because I don't know them. Not well, I didn't I know, know this no. either. I read it on a thing that our kids got from when we went to an exhibition, and um, uh, so I only found it out there. All of our listeners in Australia are going, and okay, and but I want to say a massive thank you because we do have quite a large listenership in Australia for some silly we reason. We do, yeah. Um, we've guys, just told them something bleeding obvious. But, thanks, so, guys, and sorry um, about that. To just keep it Australian, when we were at the recent um, Ren Spout uh, event. Mark Webber recognised me as I was walking through a doorway and he shook my hand <laughs> and he said, hi, mate. So there, there's my... The, did he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That's the greatest thing an Australian can say to you. Uh, what, hello? Yeah, it was. And, and a real smile, not a fake one. It was real. Oh, ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to all the, um, all the all right. people telling me, why haven't I got in contact with non-stop talking John, the auto electrician, when my element started playing up? The reason? Mm. Because I'm terrified. <laughs> Because I'm terrified that he might know <laughs> yeah, you go. that we've been That's cashing in on all the otsots behind yeah. his back yeah, yeah, and all that. Okay. Well, uh, there, that's cleared that one up. Um, thank you ever so much for listening, wherever you are, Australia or otherwise. And we'll do this all again next week. Until then, goodbye. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye. Mugs, t shirts, stickers. Mugs, t shirts, stickers. Mugs. T-shirts, stickers We might do hats soon We haven't decided This may come as a surprise But Smith and Sniff have merchandise You won't believe your eyes Smith and Sniff have merchandise Sadly we don't do pies But Smith and Sniff have merchandise one day we might sell ties Smith and Sniff have merchandise That was my Devonian sign-off, but not old money. <laughs>